Hi, everybody, and welcome. Uh, we are really excited to see such a great uh, group of folks here today at our session on measuring members' financial well being. And I'm just going to start out with a little bit of logistics and we'll get right into it. But um, I'm Ann Solomon, I'm VP of Strategic Initiatives with Inclusive, and really excited to have such a great uh, group of panelists here today on this really critical topic. Um, the session will be recorded and we'll be making the recording and slides available um, by October 11th. So don't worry about taking screenshots. We will kind of be making all this available for you and great content. Um, we'd love to have folks keep their cameras on if you're able. We'd love to see the faces in the audience and um, be able to have some Q&A at the end of this session. So if you're hearing things that raise questions for you, uh, please go ahead and put them in the chat and we'll try to get them, get to them at the end of the session. Um, and uh, please keep yourself muted uh, during the session. We want to see your faces, but we don't want to hear your dogs. <laughs> um, so, and we will mute if we're hearing background noise. Um, but with that, I want to get right into the session. I'm really excited that um, we have uh, Genevieve Melford, the Director of Insights and Evidence from the Aspen Institute Financial Security Program is gonna be moderating today's session. Um, and we have three great panelists here. Uh, Alejandro Ruales, Senior Manager with the Financial Health Network. Monica Andri, the Financial Health Program Manager with University FCU. And Cindy Shagri Raymer, uh, VP and Director of Community Development with Greylock FCU. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Jen to get us started. Awesome, thanks Ann. And good afternoon, everybody. So I just need to share that I'm really thrilled to be moderating this particular conversation today as someone who's personally spent years working to measure and research financial well-being. Uh, previously, when I worked at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and now in my work at the Aspen Institute, I really know how important, but also how tricky this work can be. So I'm really excited about all the expertise that's being brought to bear in our conversation today. So community development credit unions are mission driven. You all are in the business of serving and empowering members in ways that can boost their financial well-being. So naturally you wanna be able to measure if that's happening. But what I've come to learn is that measuring is actually only one step in a somewhat larger process, right? So the first step is defining the outcomes that you're looking for. What does success mean for you and your members? And today we're, we're talking about the concepts of financial well-being and financial health, but you know, it is important to get clear on you know, what, you're, what you mean by that and, and what you're looking to find out and measure. Um, once you've done that, you have to choose metrics for those outcomes. You decide what information would give you insight into how members are doing on the outcomes that you chose. The third step is then collecting and analyzing that data. And then finally, you make use of what you've learned, right? It was all for, for some purpose in the end. And I know that that could sound a bit overwhelming in terms of the number of steps involved, but the great thing is that our panelists today have done this work already. And what they're doing may just work just fine for you. Maybe you could just do exactly what they're doing, or at the very least, hearing from them is really going to speed up that process for you. So in our session today, we're going to hear from these three experts on the big issues related to measuring member well-being. So they're going to tell us how they think about the meaning of financial well-being or the closely related concept of financial health. So for our conversation today, we're going to treat those terms and concepts interchangeably, financial well-being and financial health. Um, we're going to learn how they're measuring these concepts. Are they using survey tools, institutional data, or both? And what some of the benefits and challenges are of these different methods. And then we're going to pull back from the nuts and bolts of measurement, and we're going to talk about what our panelists are doing with the data that they're collecting, like how it's influenced their programming, their product development, and even their sense of how credit unions can have the biggest impact on member financial health and well-being. So kind of with that, that framing and that overview of where we're going to go together today, we're going to kick it off with a question first for Alejandra from Financial Health Network. And um, Alejandra, my question for you um, is that, you know, FHN has, is well known for having developed methods for measuring the financial health 
uh, of financial institution clients specifically. So if you could please just share with us a bit about how you define financial health, what tools you use to measure it, and how you develop those. I think that would be kind of super grounding background before we go from our other topics. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Jen. And thank you to the Inclusive Virtual Conference for inviting me to present here. Very excited to be here with such a wonderful, uh, such wonderful panelists. So thank you for having me. And before we get deep into measurement, I just want to give a quick introduction uh, for those who, you're, who are not familiar with the Financial Health Network to share who we are. Um, at the Financial Health Network, our mission is to improve the financial health for all. And we fill this, miss this mission through our research, advisory services, measurement tools, which we will be discussing today, and opportunities for cross-sector collaboration. We uh, help organizations think about how their products and systems are enabling customers, employees, small businesses to build resilience and thrive. So, uh, and today we're gonna be honing in on this idea of measurement. So um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, when we think about financial health measurement, we first need to understand the definition because a lot of these methodologies and a lot of the frameworks when we, when we think about measuring, we need to think about what are the indicators that are associated um, to this definition. At the Financial Health Network, we define financial health as when your financial systems help you build resilience and pursue opportunities. We often say that what doesn't get measured doesn't get managed. Uh, and we can spend so much time thinking about new and innovative products and the next coolest thing to implement. But if we're if it's not leading to outcome, improved outcomes or improved financial health, they're not really helping or having the intended consequences. So that's why we put such an important, um, such important efforts. That's why we're so vocal about the importance of measuring financial health. So based on this definition, we created a framework. If you want to go to the next slide, uh, please. The, because financial health is really a composite framework that considers the totality of an individual's financial life. Um, there's other metrics, there's some narrower metrics like credit scores, um, but financial health really considers whether individuals are spending, saving, borrowing, and planning in a way that either it contributes to or detracts them from the resilience in the face of uh, unexpected events and it helps them indicate their ability to thrive in the longer term. That's why we use this framework around financial health and, and include different indicators of financial health. If we go to the next slide and, and keep in mind the definition that I gave you at the beginning, um, to operationalize the definition, we developed a simple framework based on eight indicators of financial health. So if you wanna think about how to define when an individual is financially healthy, we say that an individual is financially healthy when they're spending less on their income, when they're able to pay their bills on time, um, if they have sufficient liquid savings, as well as long-term savings, if they have manageable debt, if they have a prime credit score, if uh, they have appropriate insurance, and if they're able to plan ahead financially. So as you can see, these eight indicators uh, have a much more robust um, composition of someone's financial life rather than if we just focused on a credit score, for example, or how much uh, savings they have in their bank account. These all um, are different elements that we define as part of uh, an individual's financial health. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, I wanna address uh, Jen's uh, question around uh, what are the tools and how are we using the definition to help uh, credit unions, to help nonprofits and others uh, measure financial health. So for each of these indicators that I discussed before, we have created, there, there's corresponding eight survey questions that align with those indicators. And uh, once you take these questions or an individual takes these questions, you can calculate a thin health score, which is a composite score that goes from zero to 100, as well as four sub scores that are associated with each of the categories, spend, save, borrow, and plan. Um, these thin health scores are a simple average of the response values to the eight indicator questions. And to calculate these subscores, you just take the average to indicator questions corresponding to each component of financial health. Um, I, I get a lot of the question, you know, why eight indicators? Why did you decide to go with this methodology and make it a simple average? And um, it took us a really long time to develop this research. We spent um, 
I, I won't go into the details, but all of this information is on our website. But we spend a lot of time thinking about what's the value and what's the weight that should be given to each of these eight components of financial health. And we realized that, or, or the research that we did, didn't lead us to think that there was one more important than other. That's why we decided, decided to weight these um, components equally. Now, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, we develop basically, oh, actually, can you go one more? Um, and then I'll go back to this one, sorry about that. So um, I just talked about the methodology itself. And when I talk about the tomography, it's a financial health score, it's gonna be a score between zero to 100. And what a user gets is, uh, it's a segmentation of three tiers. Um, someone that receives a score between zero to 39 is considered financially vulnerable, meaning that this individual is struggling with most, if not, uh, most of, if not all of the indicators of financial health. Some of that scores between 40 and 79 is considered financially coping, um, meaning that they're struggling with some of these elements of financial health. And financially healthy is someone who is uh, spending, saving, borrowing, and planning in ways that allows them to be resilient and pursue opportunities over time. So back to that original definition. Um, I'm gonna ask you to go back to the previous slide. Sorry, sorry about that. I think I, I, I missed the order here. But, but basically um, what I want to share about this is that using this methodology or using this framework allows uh, financial services, uh, allows employers, allows nonprofits to measure the financial health and think about these eight indicators of financial health and how um, their products and services are having an impact on their customers' financial lives. So we created this FinHealth score and we created what we call the FinHealth score toolkit as a way to allow companies measure financial health uh, we put this, uh, this methodology out in the market. It's something that you can download from our website. Actually, I'm, I'm happy to, to share that link in the chat. I think someone will, will do that as well. Um, but it's very simple to use. It's something that can be implemented. Um, the FinHealth Score Toolkit has a survey guide to include the eight indicators, I'm sorry, the eight questions that I presented, the scoring logic so you know what point values are associated to each question, as well as, as, well as benchmarks. Um, some of you might be familiar with our um, U.S. Financial Health Polls research, which uh, is national research and shows uh, how Americans' financial health is moving along. We've conducted this uh, survey for several years. So this is where these benchmarks come very handy. So if you're measuring the financial health of your customers or employees, you're able to provide some comparisons against uh, these, uh, these, these uh, research that we have. Um, and then uh, finally, what I want to say with these opening remarks, if you want to go uh, two, two slides forward, please, um, is that most recently, starting in 2019, we developed another very interesting asset called Attune, which is a technology platform that lets organizations optimize for financial health. So we have the methodology. You can take that and download it from the website. It still may give you the question of how do I operationalize or how do I actually get the insights, how do I get the dashboards? Attune is a platform that can operate an, a, as a standalone solution to deploy financial health measurement surveys, uh, then benchmark and analyze results. And it could also be accessed through a set of APIs, um, enabling integrated financial health experiences for, uh, for your customers and for em your employees. So Attune basically allows you to create different dashboards, uh, disaggregate the data, the financial health data of your customers by income, race, gender, um, whatever uh, attributes you want to include in there. And um, it, it's a really interesting tool. Um, I'd love to chat more. And I think I can also send a link if anybody's interested in, in looking what that tool looks like. Um, but I, I'm, I just wanted to share also that we're very excited. We're working right now on a program um, with a tune with credit unions that are between 100 to 600 million, trying to figure out how to best deploy uh, this technology for credit unions that are within this range um, to help them measure financial health. So we're going to make an announcement later uh, about that, but just that's just what I wanted to share in terms of the methodology and the assets that we have to measure financial health. And just very excited to hear from my colleagues here um, how they have used uh, different measurement methods to move forward. So I'll stop here and uh, let my colleagues um, move the conversation forward. From here. Great. Thank you, Alejandro. That was like a really wonderful overview. And one thing I want to emphasize from your remarks is how financial health in your case, and I would say financial well-being from my research background, 
they are um, holistic concepts, right? So they are meant to be looking at someone's overall financial life. And that is something that's like a little bit unique and important I think about this construct that we're talking about today and really consistent with how Alejandro said they really found that no one of those four or eight, depending on how you want to think about it, elements is really sufficient on its own to help you understand how someone is doing overall financially. So I think that's really important. I appreciate you said that, Alejandro. Okay, so with that, I am super excited to hear from Monica, who will be our next speaker. And while she is going to tell us a lot about the nuts and bolts of what they're doing, you know, how they measure um, the financial health and well-being of their members and talk about their approaches, I'd love to ask you, Monica, to, to open your remarks by telling us a little bit about why your credit union measures financial well-being. Why, how did you get into this? Why is that important to you? Um, and then we'd love to hear an overview of how you're doing it, why you chose that approach, and if it's evolved at all over time. Absolutely, Jen. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be on the panel. You know, as you can see here on the slide, UFCU measures both our members and our employees' financial well-being because it's at the core of our mission to advance opportunities for quality education, employment, and housing. Our vision of a financially healthy community is the foundational bedrock that people need in order to build their lives and thrive in these areas. And so when we go to the next slide and you ask, you know, how do we do it? You know, although we've been doing financial health in some shape or form for 85 years as a credit union, I'm sure you all can relate. We started our financial health strategy and measurement efforts in earnest in 2017. And we wanted to better understand the needs of our members and our employees and establish a baseline and build the infrastructure to measure financial health over time. And to do that, we used the financial health network scoring framework that Alejandra just described for you. And it allowed us to segment our populations into to healthy coping and vulnerable. That meant that we knew what financial health pillars people were struggling with and what percentage of our population needed help. And so that's really great in anchoring us and starting that planning. You can see from the slide here that we start at the high level segmentation, 48% of our employees and 61% of our members are struggling financially in some way. And we can dive deeper into the instrument and look at the eight questions that make up the survey. And all those eight questions are tied to the indicators that Alejandra mentioned. And we can identify deeper insights, you know, some insights, for example, are that 54% of our members do not save regularly. There's an opportunity there or 35% of our employees report unmanageable debt. So there's also an insight there. And these are just one of the few insights that we're able to share that really provided some direction. And so when we talk about why did you choose that approach, you know, we chose the survey approach because directionally it gives us a place to start enough information to start designing programs and solutions to test. The Financial Health Network has just launched the Attune uh, version of this survey and, you know, it's definitely cut our deployment timeframe in half from months to just a few weeks, if not days. And that allowed us to launch several small pilots with the survey information, developing programming and services using an employee-centric approach in the design of the financial health program because we know ultimately if our employees are financially healthy, they would have newfound confidence and experience and that would translate into our membership's financial health, eventually allowing us to build a financial health platform for all. And so, um, you know, we positioned the employee participation, not from the perspective of if you raise your hand, you're letting us know you have problems. That's definitely not the way to go about it. But if you raise your hand, you'd like to help build what our members will ultimately experience. And that has a totally different feel to it. And they feel part of that success. And so we're happy to visit with anybody about our employee financial health program. Uh, but to move on to the next slide and you asked about how, how we evolved. We started with the survey. How do you evolve from that? You know, the slide that you see here is what we call our Plan U Hub. And um, this is an outcome of those pilots and testing and insights. It's a microsite that we developed in May of um, 2020 in response to COVID and the effort to make financial health resources timely and available to our membership. You know, nobody expected COVID to happen, and we know that financial worries were very much part of that experience. 
And because we knew that people were struggling with savings and debt and spending and other things, we made available an online education center here under the Discover tab that really allows people to self-serve short bite-sized interactive modules. If they really had a pressing um, you know, concern that they really wanted to connect with, we set up a, an email uh, queue that allowed for them to contact us immediately and kind of bypass some of the regular you know, um, contact center waiting that was happening. Um, or they can just, you know, schedule a one-on-one -on -one consultation under our plan tab and meet with one of our certified financial counselors through CUNA. And so with each of these components, you can extract visitor data, user data, specific information about what content or topics they are consuming, conversion rates from visitors to consultations and so on. So as we move to the next slide, you know, we've evolved um, our measurement approach to not only include the survey, but to collect data points from our Pathways platform, uh, which is a counseling platform that Inclusive provides where you capture the entire session and it allows for us to gather data. I promise Financial Health Network and Inclusive did not pay me for these, <laughs> for these highlights on their products. Uh, they've just really been at the forefront of the platforms we were needing and after extensive research, just pro proved to be the best partners. And so from this slide, you can see that the consultations allow us to capture data like credit scores. What, what are, where are they starting? Baseline Financial Health Network scores. They're, they're starting in the coping. Um, and that really was our target demographic, when we have the segmentation, you get to choose where do you start? Are you going to try to tackle all of them or start in one place? Um, and then, you know, the take actions, people were letting us know in the consultations what they were coming to us for, what prompted them to take action. Did they want to fix their credit? Did they want to get organized and build a budget or manage debt? And so from here, you can go into the impact. And in, in the next slide, you'll see that at a six month time frame, we can see credit score movement. What we can tell here is that, you know, maybe credit score per se, movement in the credit score isn't the issue that we need to address or what we really need to pinpoint, it's debt load. And so reduction in debt, you can see here loan and asset products opened um, is available through the pathways. It's not one of our goals to sell product through consultations by any means. In fact, we require that the counselors remain impartial and recommend many alternatives, but we realize that as a byproduct of helping the member and having their trust, they want to take action and use UFCU for their refinances and other products. And so you can see here that we can collect whether they have completed take actions. That's really showing that uh, members are taking um, action and changing behavior, which is always what we want to see. And so we've got a ton more data to share. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, I know that we don't have all the time in the world, Helen, by saying that working with data is like pulling a thread. It never stops running. As you keep unraveling, you get other questions to ask and answer. And the big news, folks, is that there isn't a silver bullet for financial health measurement or a one size fits all approach. It all depends on what your organizational goals are, what your priorities are. Do you want to measure several financial health indicators or just start with one? I mean, I could go on for hours, but I'll stop here. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me share a little bit of our journey. I hope it's been helpful. That's a really wonderful presentation, Monica. I appreciate that so much. And it clearly it tees up a lot more that I know that we'll be discussing together, you know, about what, what good this really does you to do, right? And, and what you've done to make use of it. You already previewed that some. And, and one thing from your remarks that really struck me was you're showing at the very beginning how the use of the financial health measurement tool specifically gives you diagnostic value. Right? It doesn't just tell you how are people doing, are they coping, are they thriving? It allowed, it really struck me that you said that, that this particular methodology allowed you to pinpoint where are the real spots you know, for improvement and where an organization such as yours could make an impact. Is it around savings frequency? Is it around debt reduction? And I think that's really important. So thank you for that. Um, okay, so now next, really the, the same set of questions um, for, for Cindy, and I think they do things a little bit differently at her credit union, so it's going to be kind of exciting to, to hear some of those differences, and then we'll get into the discussion. So please take it away, Cindy. Thank you. 
Thank you, Jen. And it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. And just listening to my other panelists, I'm in awe of them and going to do some shout outs too. So I will start with the why. Why do we measure financial wellness at Greylock? Well, our vision is to enable our community to thrive and financial wellness is a key indicator of that. It also drives our strategic plan, the products we create, the services we offer, educational topics that we really need to deliver, and even strategic community partnerships. You really need to know what is and is not working. You need to stay nimble and you got to constantly be changing. So I'm going to run the gamut with the way we're doing our financial well-being measurements at Greylock. So next slide, please. So one method does not fit all. As we've been hearing, we use coaching stories, questionnaires. I'm going to pause here and give a shout out to Alejandro because we just signed on with a tune. So we've now added the Attune questionnaires. I'll be launching that in Q4. So that's going to add another level to what we can do with our diagnostics and what needs to happen. Metrics, I'm preaching in the choir with metrics. We all have to track them and use them across the board. And then the community impact report. So I'll do a deeper dive on these topics. Next slide, please. So the coaching stories. Every person that we coach, we actually capture the narrative. We see what's going on with them. If it's um, goals they want to set, uh, things they need to fix. We take a very holistic approach. We also incorporate referrals to our community partners because we're not going to talk to somebody about how much money that you need to save or make if you don't have enough money to feed your kids or heat your house. So we do that whole family approach and hook up the other services. And we share these stories after we remove the names, of course, for privacy with our senior leadership team, our board of directors, and our staff. Now, our senior leadership team and our board of directors, that the stories really put that human touch to it. They get the metrics, but having the stories and seeing how people's lives are being dramatically improved by the combination of the education, the coaching, the products that we're delivering, it helps with the budget, the active staff, the strategic direction, and we get their support, which is needed and greatly appreciated. The staff, that's a little different. And I am so pleased to tell you that sharing the stories with the staff has really inspired them. And I'd say over the last two years, we've had staff self-recruit. They talk to either myself or the team, and they are so excited by the work that we're doing, they want to become coaches. So I am thrilled to tell you that at this point in time, Greylock has 27 certified credit union financial coaches, and they're still growing and we're still training. And it's just been a real win-win to move things forward. And I'm going to borrow a, a word from uh, Dr. Martin and Renee Sati White, and it was intentional. And I would say Greylock became very intentional with the focus on community development in 2016, and it's just been growing since, since we started. Like I said, nimble, constantly changing, constantly learning and adding. So next slide, please. Keep going. <laughs> so this one I'm just going to lightly touch on with the mini questionnaires. So we get that questionnaire and our intention is to start it with the coaches then the very first day, we also want to have all of our employees do it because like one of the other panelists did say, we do want to measure the financial health of not only your membership, but also your employees. And we want to capture all that. So as we fade in, we'll click forward here. We do have that one mini question because this will allow you to do a deeper dive. Your credit report is not going to show how you're paying bills if you do some of them on time. It usually hits a credit report when it's at the charge off state. So knowing how people feel, which is why we did like the Attune product, because it allows you to take a more deeper dive approach into what's happening there. And then ultimately, as we slide in next, we want to revisit that. So we want to meet with them again and then see, has the questionnaire changed? Has the answers changed? Do we need to do more with product development and services? What else can we do to keep everything going and really make sure that the financial wellness is improving? So 
never sit back on your laurels, constantly, constantly divide. So divide, conquer, add. So we'll, we'll be following up. I'm really excited to get a tune launched. Next slide, please. So metrics, we all live and die by our metrics. These come into play for so many different things. You share them with the senior leadership team. You share them with the board. You need to use them when you are going for secondary capital and accessing grants. These are incredibly important. So these are just some of the metrics that Greylock is capturing. And these metrics are also based on our coached folks. So as soon as we coach people, and that includes members and non-members, so for even those that are non-members, because a lot of times family members will come in after somebody's been coached, and we'll be adding them to that list. And we can actually measure that $400 benchmark that we've talked about. I keep seeing different statistics that 67% of US households do not have a spare $400 to handle an emergency. That's a very sobering thought, and I'm thrilled to be working with all the credit unions and the CDCUs out there to really make an impact and change that. It shouldn't be that way. There's too much predatory lending out there. So we are specifically looking at that. The overdraft fees, we hope that they do go down and decrease because we want to teach people to have power over their money and not let money have power over them. So being able to know when your balance is at a certain point to get those warnings, to have affordable products like an overdraft line of credit to kick in. These are the tools we want to give. We measure our coaching sessions. We got a lot of one and dones, but then there's a lot of repeats. They get very, very attached to their coach. They like to share their little, um, when you achieve something, you don't wanna say, I wanna pay all my bills. It's like, let's pay this credit card, then the second credit card. And they love to come in and share with their coaches. I paid off a credit card or no overdraft fees this month. So it's so rewarding. So we set up multiple sessions. Um, the loan types, what is our group of coaching folks using for loans and the interest that they're paying? And average balances, how are their shares in checking? Have they increased after our coaching sessions? Have they decreased? What are their loans and mortgages looking like? And a shout out to one of my colleagues, Gloria, who's done an amazing job with really promoting the ITIN lending. So our ITIN lending is also captured in all these coaching sessions because there's actually a part of the coaching session addresses just banking in the US that is so different from other countries, how we look at banking and credit here. So the educational component goes hand in hand. And also the community development loan portfolio performance. These are high risk loans. Predominantly most of the loans we do, especially the micro loans are underwritten on ability to pay, not FICO. And another thing I do wanna share with everybody on the call today if you can have community partners like community action councils, for instance, they get grant funds and they can put their grant funds into your credit union and you can use the grant funds to actually offset the risk exposure on these loans. You can do some really deep dive lending and they will refer to you and you are giving micro loans to really help people overcome when life happens, when those tires blow out. So I highly recommend that you do those partnerships. You can actually impact your community at an exponential level. And I am happy to say that our community development loan portfolio performance is pretty amazing with all the risks that we do have in there. So it's been super low. Next slide, please. This is one of my absolute favorite metrics. And why is it my favorite metric? Because 64% of the FICO scores with our coaching members have increased. So that's very telling. Like I just said, we don't use FICO as a means to approve many of the loans in community development. We use ability to pay, but we still address the FICO and we work with members on how to improve it. We help them get rid of fraud that's on there. We also get them into tools like Experian Boost so they can get credit for how they're paying their utilities. So there's a wide range of ways to help them get that control and get proper information on what you're doing with FICO. So next slide, please. Now I'm gonna have them just load up everything in here. So as I'm not gonna talk each individual one. I wanna encourage all of the folks on the line here today, do a little shameless self-promotion. You are doing so much amazing things in your community. You really gotta tell people about that and put that community impact report, put it on your website. You're going to, need it if you're going for grants. It can be a great report for 
you know, new people that are looking to work for you. They want to know how do you, you know, what are you doing in the community? So you can actually use it as a wonderful recruitment tool when people, your mission, vision, and values are in sync with what they're looking to do. Also, members and new businesses like to bank with financial institutions that are very active in the community. So 2020 was a really difficult year for us. But as you can see by some of these numbers, we still reached like just 2,200 2, students through our Bonsai Financial Wellness Program. It's all online. So when schools were shutting down and everything had to be on Zoom, what a wonderful platform. Even our financial wellness classes, everything was Zoom. So we had to do you know, the Zoom classes to get that out. We do have on staff an IRS I-10 agent, and she was able to get 91 immigrants I-10s. And the reason why we got into that is we found out that people were being charged anywhere from $200 to $700. We offer this service for free. So that is really a life-changing event that we can do. Um, 2.5 million in emergency loans at 0% for our emergency response. So people working in the fire department, um, nurses, doctors, the people had to work every day regardless of COVID. So we did a 0% loan with six months waived. Generous deferments, as you can see, 4,000 jobs saved. Got a shout out to my boss in the commercial lending department. That's the power of the PPP loans. Those PPP loans saved a lot of jobs. And in Berkshire County, there's a lot of service industry jobs with restaurants and arts venues. So PPP loans were the lifeblood of our county. We still did 1,850 coaching sessions. Our specialty loan portfolio you can see is 1.8 million. That does include I-10. And last but not least, if people aren't doing new road loans, I would absolutely say get into those new road loans. They save people from predatory car loans, which are anywhere from 20 to 30%. And we can pull them into the new road loan when you're looking at kind of the highest rate is about 12. You can even get into three. And every month that they pay on time for a year, that particular product decreases the interest rate by 1%. So you're actually encouraging that on-time payment. You're rewarding with an interest rate. And we did look at the portfolio and found we saved 650000 in interest for people that were in those predatory loans. So Put your information out there, use it for your grant report writing, attract people and do a little bragging because you all deserve it. You're doing an amazing job out there. Thank you. Thanks, Cindy. That was very inspiring and like really a ton of great information. Both, both you and Monica have started to, to talk about ways in which you're using and communicating this data and, and that kind of roundup of you know, audiences and uses there it was really helpful, Cindy. I'd love to ask the, the two of you, and I think we could probably go ahead and take the, um, take the slides down now, because now we're just gonna get into our, our sort of pure conversation portion of the session. Um, thank you, Megan. Um, I, I'm wondering if, uh, Monica and Cindy, if you could say a little bit more specifically about how doing this financial health measurement has, has specifically influenced the products and services that you're offering. Uh, whether that was like a revision of a product that you had, uh, whether it was targeting it to a different group, whether it was the adding of coaching and counseling. I was really struck that both of your presentations couldn't make, made clear that financial coaching and counseling are really central to this approach paired with your core you know, CU product line. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll pause there. I have a few follow-ups, but let me just ask you to reflect on, on you know, really how this is affecting like really just draw the through line for us from, you know, you've invested so much in collecting this data. What's the through line from that to the impact on your specific products and services? You want me to start, Cindy? <laughs> okay, well, you know, it, it has a very direct, um, you know, through line there. When we when we measure, I mentioned earlier, you have to know where to start, right? What what problems are you going to solve for? And so, in that case, um, when we saw that debt and savings was a real um, concern for our membership and our employees, um, then we have some decisions to make. Um, what intervention or product or service is going to best tackle that. And so with that, um, with the savings, we've launched a 
uh, a savings campaign called the, the the savings challenge saving with purpose challenge we do um, you know prize pool to incent our uh, partners and our employees to save um, average savings over twelve hundred dollars we set the minimum at you know ten dollars and people are saving on average a hundred you know and so those um, measurements allowed us to pinpoint where to start the learning. Um, obviously, we need to look at financial health holistically and, um, you know, in all the pillars, saving, spending, borrowing, and planning. Uh, and then you also pay attention to what your credit union does best um, and how it aligns with the other services and delivery and products. You, you can't have a department that just focuses on financial health and tries to build this whole experience without bringing along the rest of the organization. And so giving that measurement allows for you to share and reflect with your other peers um, in lending and collections and mortgage and make sure that everybody's moving in that direction together and owns a piece of that responsibility. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there for Cindy to follow up with. A great segue. It truly takes a village. And I did talk about a lot of the stuff being in community development, but I would be remiss if I didn't say it was the entire credit union, the branches, people in finance, people in collections, it, it runs the gamut. And even our coaches are represented in all of the above. So we don't like just have coaching from just lending or member service. We do welcome from all the different areas. I like to say I can teach people to do a specific task, but I can't teach them to care. And if they come in and they care and they really truly want to help, those are the ones you want doing it. So has the measurement of the financial well-being changed our direction? Absolutely. Constantly, we are developing. The curriculum is always being tweaked. The topics are being added. COVID really made us focus on accessibility. When our branches were wide open, but our drive throughs were, we had to be very nimble and helpful and people that had never used like online banking or mobile deposit capture. It, these were so integral to give them that 24 seven service that we wanted them to be able to embrace, understand, not be intimidated by. So videos were created, they were done in Spanish. We do have English ones on our website. So getting people the tools, what they need was something that came out. Another thing is the product development. As you're working with people and talking and learning about their struggles, that's where a lot of product development comes into play. That's where the 0% uh, first responder loan came in, but then even putting a six months deferment to give people a chance to get used to this horrific new normal of the pandemic, you need a chance to ease in. So building in six month deferment periods was something pretty new. Looking at the whole ability to pay as opposed to a FICO score, looking at alternative ways to do credit worthiness is something that we are actively investigating and spreading our wings and really doing more and more products. Targeted products for people, especially building wealth and access to homes for people of color, the ITIN lending, all of these are new products and programs. And at Greylock, we like to stress, it's not either or, it's and. So everything we're doing is in addition to what we currently had because our membership really runs the gamut. You've got older people that like very traditional lending. You've got our younger members that really like tech. So you really need that high tech, high touch. And don't forget that human aspect where you really need to also have people picking up the phone, meeting with you in person. So it is a huge commitment. It takes a lot of time effort, but it is worth its weight in gold, and you can actually have a direct impact in the communities that you serve. So it's worth it. I recommend it and wouldn't want to do anything else. Thank you. And quick plug for our whole audience. I, I'm about to, to ask Alejandra one more um, question for her right now, but then we're going to open it up to all of you. So please be putting your questions for our um, clearly incredibly expert panelists in here. I'm sure you have a thousand questions about you know, how to actually implement or, or some trade-offs that they're making or any of the above. So please be putting those in the, the chat in the next couple of minutes. So Alejandra, I know that Financial Health Network works with a wide range of financial institution partners. Obviously you do this work um, you know, with credit unions, but also 
very broadly and have been doing so for years. And it's kind of been your mission to get financial institutions really pulling toward the North, the North Star of financial health in everything we do. So I'm curious if there are other kinds of examples of ways that you've seen um, financial institutions impact their product services orientation behavior based on measuring the financial health of their customers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's there's too many things that I want. I want to give one example and then I want to really reflect on what Cindy and Monica said because they basically just answered this question for me in the multiple ways that they're using these measurement uh, results. So kudos to them for doing my job easier at giving uh, additional examples. I just gave a bunch of them. But one that I think is really interesting, and they they alluded, they both alluded to these. Measurement can also be used as a way, as a, almost as a customer engagement tool in a way that you can develop a journey with them. So uh, I, I believe both Monica and Cindy alluded in a way that you have a customer that might, a member that might come in to talk to your advisor that is engagement. And using measurement, or we've seen a lot of credit unions, for example, using advisors as a way to say, let's take these eight questions, right? Just referring to financial health networks methodology and say, to just give us a point of start. Because sometimes, um, and what we've seen in research is that it is difficult to tell someone that might be in this vulnerable category that is struggling with a lot of areas of financial health, you need to improve in all, or you need to take care of your bills, you need to save, or short-term and long-term. And, and that can be very difficult. So using measurement to identify how, to, how can you help uh, your members prioritize some of those uh, areas to focus on and then develop a plan and develop in some way, this customer engagement journey with them. So you can say, you know what? It looks like you have some really predatory loans, so you have a lot of debt. Maybe let's focus there first. Let's start building some savings so you don't have to depend on high debt uh, solution, or I'm sorry, high interest solutions in case that your car breaks down, as, as Cindy said. So, so there's this idea of building it or using measurement as a customer engage, engagement tool or as part of an onboarding process. We've seen also different um, financial institutions use it as a way to, when you have a new member come in and say, uh, we're excited for you to be part of our credit union. Let's see where you're at and let's see how we can be part of this journey and help you prioritize some of these things. So that's that's one thing that I felt both Monica and, and Cindy are doing well and, and just like wanted to emphasize that piece. But beyond that, I think like, where, where I believe that organizations or credit unions um, like Monica's and, and Cindy's are doing a really great job is thinking about financial health measurement, uh, not just as one of the activities that they do, but it's almost driving their strategic plan and partnerships and the way that they think about not only what's working, but also what's not. And that is a very important point to make because often, you know, there's these solutions that uh, companies have had for years but because they haven't measured the impact that they're having, there, there might be, you know, there might be a lot of members that are using it, but maybe they're actually not saving that much. They might have, and we, we actually have done some testing or impact testing where a credit union in particular, they decided to launch a new savings tool to encourage savings. And then as a result of the test, they realized that their anchor was too low. So as a result, custom or members, I'm sorry, were, um, were saving less than what they expected. And that was a fabulous finding, to be quite honest, because then they were able to realize very quickly that they needed to change the anchor, change the wording. So um, I'm saying all of this uh, as a way to reflect that measurements should not be existing as one of the activities that your credit union, that your organization does, but most as a way to drive strategic action. Where do we need to invest or prioritize um, in terms of the tools that our members need and where is maybe our credit union not having enough resources? Do we have good uh, products for our item members? Do we have good products for short-term savings? Um, so, so I just wanted to make that point because in, in a lot of cases, uh, measurement just is part of the data and analytics department and then you share a dashboard with leadership and that's great. But if it's a driving strategic action, then I think it's, it's not being as powerful as it could be. So that's just a, a very important message that I wanted to send to the audience that I think Cindy and Monica documented really well how it can be used to really drive a point across and, and be communicated across the organization. Thank you, Alejandra. So I see we, um, we just got a question in that is for Cindy and Monica, uh, which is, and it's the first in appreciation <laughs> for your great presentations, but is if you mentioned having CUNA financial coaches, how is that structured in your organization? Do you have a designated team and have developed specific procedures to do that? 
I'll, I'll take that one. Okay, so the fact that we have 27, obviously it's very robust. And what we found is when we started this back in 2016, a handful of us were studying you know, on our own. But to really refine it and grow the way we have, I'm thrilled to say that one of the core members of the community development team, Stephanie, who's also on this call, uh, actually oversees the training. So we do the CUNA, the FICEP program, but she actually holds classes. And so when people are studying for it, they come together in a class. Um, Greylock is wonderfully supportive and gives them the time to do this during business hours. So they meet on a regular basis. They do a lot of reading on their own. They come back, they ask questions, they learn from their peer group and other people that have become CCUFCs. And so we kind of guide them through it. Stephanie does the regular classes, then they take the exam. They always pass because the training is fabulous. Then once they get you know, that under their belt, there's also the opportunity for the shadow training because it's sometimes a little intimidating. Well, I've read everything. I feel like I'm you know, on spot with what I'm doing, but depending what their background is, are they member service, are they collections? We all have our strong points and our comfort zone. So being able to shadow train before you actually get into the coaching, which is very natural because when you are in member service or lending, you really are coaching and guiding. But then when you actually have to capture it, make a narrative, put it into the coaching queue to show what you're doing, it adds that additional layer. So those are the level of support that we do is the classes, keeping up with it. And you do have to be recertified every three years. And one thing we do is we don't, consider it a coaching session and with a certified coach until you have that certification. So we, we do track that, we're, we're strict with that. And we, we just find it's been very rewarding because the quality of the coaching and the advice that's given and even the product development, a lot of ideas come from everybody on the team because ideas are celebrated, vetted, looked at, and you, you never know which direction you're gonna go in. So constant learning, a very high high tech learning environment here, I'd say. Monica, I, I, I'm going to ask actually a follow on question about coaching, but if you had anything to add to what, um, what Cindy just said, feel free to wrap that in as well. So no, I, I covered it. Awesome. As I want to pull back for a second on this question of coaching and get into like, what, why, how, why, how did you as organizations that are, you know, historically primarily providers of financial products and services, like, how did you get into knowing that coaching was going to be such an important complement to that core business. Um, what what brought that about for you? How do you think about that? Um, and a related question from um, from our audience is: Is coaching for everyone? Is it for all your members? How do you how do you think about that question? Of like, is it how do, who is it targeted to? Who does it work best for? Is it for everyone? And how does that complement your other services? Sure, I can take that one. Um, so let me see. Let me start with saying that, you know, you you play to your strengths, right? If your credit union is ahead of the game with technology, with your apps, with your online banking, then you probably have a more digital focus membership. And so you want to be in that space and meet them where they are. If your credit union is all about relationships and high touch you know, um, engagement in the community and things like that, then that's usually where you start. It's most familiar to you. And so we decided to do the coaching because we know that that's what we do. UFCU is known and differentiates themselves in the Austin community because of those relationships and, and um, that excellent service. And so once we felt like we, we had what it looked like, what it sounded like, what it felt like, how we were going to measure it, then we can take pieces of that and distribute that across the organization so that everybody plays a, a role into that. Now, I think um, your other question about um, you know, where, where, what were some of the, what was this, the second question? Redirect me here. Sorry, it was like, maybe how and for whom, does, okay. uh, which of your members is coaching a really important compliment? And I think there's really two right. aspects to that question. One is, who are you most hoping will receive it in the sense of how you think about, you know, who could benefit most from it? But someone sure. asked a very good question in the chat, which is, well, to what extent does their mindset and desire for it matter? Right, 
right? And so, um, you know, in our experience, when we rolled out the segmentation and we saw that, you know, um, 30 plus 36 percent of our membership was in coping. This is middle America folks, right? People who are um, have have income coming in, they're paying their bills, they're maybe saving a little, but not so much, not to the degree that they have. And then there's two populations within that coping, right? The, the strivers who really are actively seeking and waiting for their credit union to do something, and then the ones that are living paycheck to paycheck. And so when we decided, okay, who's going to benefit from the coaching, we know that the coping population is a target market, and there's going to be several personas in there, right? There's going to be the ones that have been waiting and are actively using apps and your online banking and the ones that um, are just waiting for you to say, hey, the doors are open in this space. Then you've got the ones that maybe um, have some hesitancy because of some past experiences. Um, and so what we're finding is um, we're doing a soft rollout. We haven't done a big major push to all our membership, but we're finding that um, people are finding us organically on their own without any marketing push. And out of the 3,000 visitors that we're getting um, to the site, you know, 12% um, are use, are choosing consultation. So that is directionally saying, okay, when people are looking for this content, are they self-serving? 20% are going uh, the microsite with the modules and 12% are choosing. So, so that's how we're learning yeah. what, what that capacity might be. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's so helpful. And I do note that we're um, at time. Can I ask the three panelists to please put your email addresses in the chat so that um, so folks can reach out to you directly with more follow-up questions, which I actually see starting to flow in, which is phenomenal. So with that, I'm going to say a huge, huge thank you. I learned a lot from you. Appreciated being part of this. And I'm going to turn it over to Anne. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. All oh, this was a really great session. Um, and hopefully you all can continue the conversation directly uh, with our panelists with some of these follow-up questions, but we'll, we'll try to get back to you offline. Um, thanks everyone for tuning in. It was really great uh, to have so many of you in the room and to, for folks to be so engaged on the chat, really appreciate it. And thank you again to our panelists um, for awesome content and stories. And thank you for showing the impact that you're having. Um, I will ask folks, uh, to join us at 3.30 for our final session of the conference, which is advocating for low income communities. We will be joined by uh, Senator Mark Warner for some special remarks in that session, as well as uh, some of our CDC leaders, including uh, Bill Bynum of uh, Hope Credit Union. So uh, I have a short break here, and then we hope to see you at 3.30 in the general session. Thanks again so much. Have a good one.